Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. How are you today? Uh, welcome online. We're glad that you're joining us. We are in a series called Giants of Faith. We're looking at giants of faith. We, uh, if you look in Hebrews 11, there's a list of just ordinary people that are in the Bible, but because they, they followed what God had for them, they ended up doing some pretty extraordinary things. And so we were thinking, what would it be like to like have one of those kind of come and talk to us. And so our theme verse is the very first verse of the next chapter, Hebrews 12. If you notice on your outline, follow with me. It says, therefore, in other words, because of, they're just reading through these, the hall of, the hall of fame of faith. He says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that's those guys. He says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So we have a race we're running. This is our season, our generation, our time. But here's people that have run their race. And he says they're witnessing. So if you've ever wondered, do people in heaven, can they see us? The Bible's clear. Yes, they can see us. In fact, they're rooting us on. And they know life is tough. They, they ran their race. They know how difficult it is. And so they're there to encourage us. And, 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 and it says this cloud of witnesses. You know, uh, if you go to a, a big stadium and Everybody's kind of cheering. You, you can hear the roar, which is pretty thrilling, but you don't hear the individual voices. And so kind of in our mind's eye, we're saying, what if one of them were to get up out of the stands and come and run a lap of the race with us? What kind of encouragement would they give us? What kind of words of wisdom? And so that's, that's what we're doing is we're letting each one, each week over these eight weeks, one of them's coming down and they're running with us. They're talking to us. They're encouraging us. We're getting encouraged because of it, and we're also learning our Bible a little better. Today we're going to be looking at, because in, you know, since it's Father's Day, we're going to be looking at a great father, Jacob. I mean, Jacob was one of the fathers of our faith. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, he's the grandson of Abraham, the son of Isaac. And in his own right, he is a father. He fathered 12 sons, which became, the, became Israel, became the Jewish nation. In fact, if you were, if, if a Jew, if, if somebody who's Jewish, if they were to take one of those popular DNA tests that are going around right now, you know, Ancestry.com or whatever, and, and 23andMe, it, it, I don't know, I've not done those, but, uh, but if it goes back far enough, they would go, they would trace their lineage all the way back to one of those 12 sons. That's, that's, where, the, that's where the whole Jewish nation came from. It goes all the way back to Jacob. So we're looking at Jacob's life. He had a great impact. He, he, he uh, uh, through his obviously being a father, but also through his own life. There's a lot in the Bible about Jacob. It would take eight weeks alone just on him to kind of cover his life. There's a lot that is, that is recorded, and we're going to be able to kind of highlight a few things, and we're going to really pull some lessons from his life. There's really a lot we can learn. One of the things, kind of an overarching thing we see from Jacob's life is that Jacob Jacob kind of missed a lot of the things he had hoped for. There was, there was a lot of things he was kind of dreaming of about his life that it didn't turn out like that. And so because of that, he tries to maneuver things in his own strength. He tries to make things happen the way he thinks they should, they should, they should work out. 
And, uh, and we see this happening over and over, and he ends up becoming miserable over and over, trying to do things, trying to make things work out the way he had hoped that they were, or kind of, and, and I think guys are particularly susceptible to this, uh, trying, to, trying to write and write our own script, make things happen the way we think they should work out. Even if it means bending the rules or manipulating things, we want it to work out a certain way. And Jacob did this, and he ends up being miserable time and time again because he's, he's not, in, in a big part of his life, there, he's just not really depending on God. He's just trying to do it in his own right, and, and, and he ends up making a mess of things. But then at some point, we see in Jacob's life really later on, he, he, he surrenders his life to God, lets God have control of his life, and then it, it changes things. I mean, it's a game changer for him like it would be for you and me, when we finally come to, and we realize, hey, I, I can't just do this all in my own, in my own right. I need, I need God to help me with this. And J Jacob is guilty of this. In fact, his, his name, Jacob, actually comes all the way back from being somebody who manipulates. And it, he's like born with that. I mean, from day one, he's trying to control things. You say day one, you mean the day he was born? Actually, yes. It's a really a fascinating story. You, you can read it. It's a, it starts in Genesis 25 and then goes forward from there. But when he's born, he's a twin. And in that day, whoever was the firstborn got like this greater blessing, this greater amount of, you know, inheritance and so forth. And so he's born and before his brother can get out of the womb, it's just like he grabs onto his brother's heel and it's just like yanking him back in because he's like wrestling to get out. You know, and, 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 and uh, so his parents kind of, they name him Jacob. They go, well, you know, you're kind of trying to manipulate things here. So that's what, that, that's what the word means is, you know, you're, you're trying to make things happen in your own strength. And we just see this continuing all throughout his life. He's always trying to, you know, manufacture things to work out good for him often manipulating things and, and trying to script his own life. He does it later on with his brother. His brother's older. He's, he's, his brother's a hunter. His brother's Esau. He comes home one day. He's just famished, real hungry. And Jacob's cooking a, a bowl of lentil soup. And so his brother, he, he says, hey, I'll do anything for a bowl of that soup. And so Jacob goes, hey, why don't you give me your birthright? And he goes, okay, that's fine. I mean, he, 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 because of it just satisfying his appetite for the day, he sells off his future. You know, there's a lot of people that do that. Some of you have, may have done that. Where you just, for your appetite for today, what, you know, your, your current desires, you sell off a part of your future. There's, certainly there's a lesson there. But here we see Jacob doing that, and then he does it again when his father's older, and he kind of gets his mom in on this one, or they're doing it together, and they're, he ends up getting a, a, a uh, an inheritance blessing that should have gone to Jacob. He tricks him in order to do that. He tricks his father, but his, his, his brother's hairy. So he actually gets some, some skin, some animal skins and like, and like duct tapes it to his arms. So, cause his dad couldn't see real well. And so his dad goes, let me touch you. And he touches, he goes, you're furry. Like, you know, you saw it. I mean, he's, he's always trying to manipulate things. And so we see, and, and, and he ends up worse condition, not better. <clears throat> so, one of the reasons that the Bible records people like Jacob and some of these other men and women we're studying is because we can learn from them. I mean, we, you don't have to go through all of this yourself. Part, when, when we, part of the instruction that we get from God's word is here's what you can do so you don't have to make those same mistakes. And so we can learn from Jacob in this case, hey, what are the things, you know, that we can do? Because Christians certainly are guilty of this. We can put our faith in Christ and then really, we don't want God to control things. We just, some people, they're just, they stay in the shallow end. They go, I just want fire insurance. You know, I just don't want to go to hell. I just, you know, I just want, you know, God to be happy with me. But instead of really saying, hey, if I let go and let God direct my life and write the script, that's where I'll find some real, real significant blessing in my life. And I want to look at that. I think that we get, Three huge benefits we learn from this. When we let God control our life. And now for Jacob, he, um, as I said, he had tricked his brother, 
multiple times. His brother finally is, has this vendetta because he's out to kill him. So he has to run for his life. He runs for his life. He's gone for 20 years. He's coming back. By this point, he's gotten married and he's, uh, he's, he's got a lot of possessions and he's afraid for his life. And so he's coming back and, uh, and uh, he actually splits up his possessions. He says, okay, you know, uh, some of you go with the animals this way. Some of you go that way. That way, if Esau kills us, maybe he can't kill us all. And he's left alone this particular night. He's left alone between him and God. And the, he, has the, the, he starts to wrestle spiritually with God. And this is where we kind of pick up this story. But what I want to point out is, is that when you, when you connect with God, you get a new strength. And this is what Jacob gets. He gets a new strength when he, goes, uh, when he goes and has this wrestling match. And so that's where we pick up the story. He says, this left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. When the man saw that he would not win the match, he touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. So now the word man here uh, is a poetic way the Bible refers to God or an angel of the Lord. This is certainly a, a, a spiritual experience that's happening. He's wrestling with God, trying to, it's really a, a who's going to be in control? This is what this wrestling match is about. Some of you are wrestling with God about that. You know, God, God's wanting to have control over your life. Over, he wants to direct who you marry, your dating life, your sexuality, your money, your vocation, your hobbies, and it's a wrestling match. All the time, it's just wrestling, wrestling, wrestling. This is what's going on with Jacob. He's wrestling with God. Who's going to be in control? And at some point, you know, he's so self-reliant, he's, he's not willing to give in. His, his, the angel pops his hip out of his socket. He kind of he goes, you think you're so strong? And he kind of gives him this weakness, this pain that's with him. And that's often what happens to us, right? I mean, we wrestle with God and God, sometimes he, he, he brings that pain into our life. More, more often than not, we bring it in ourselves. He allows it to happen or somebody else brings it. Some crisis happens in our life that shakes us to the core and we realize, wow, I, I, my strength isn't enough in this situation. I need more than that. You know, this is Father's Day, and for those of you who are fathers, you know that sometimes your kids, they do things that you wish they wouldn't, but some kids, they just won't learn by you just telling them. You have to go through some of the hard knocks of life. You don't want that for them. You would love to spare them of that, but you let them go through that because you love them, you care about them, and you know what? And sometimes painful things in our lives cause us to really wrestle and make some changes. This is what's going on here. Each one of us end up wrestling with God, some of us more than others, and sometimes it's the painful things in life that cause us to, to relinquish, to let go, to say, hey, I'm, this, is, this is too hard. When you try to live life in your own strength, you find yourself, you're always tired. So Jesus speaks to this. He says this, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened. And he goes, and I will give you rest. Now, how does God, how does, what kind of rest does he offer? Well, if you didn't know how this verse ended, you would think Jesus would fill in the blank by saying, well, and, and I would encourage you to take a nap, right? <laughs> or if you go take a cruise, get one of those little uh, drinks within a little umbrella and, you know, do something. That's, that's where you're going to find rest. But this is not what Jesus says. Interestingly or ironically, Jesus says the way you find rest is you continue to work, but you just work a different way. Notice what he says here. He says, take my yoke. That's a work. That's, a, that's something that farmers use. It's a working apparatus. Take my yoke and learn from me. So he's saying, hey, you had a different yoke you were working with. Now you're going to learn a different way. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Oh, you, there's, uh, this word yoke really has two different meanings. Now, the yoke is uh, something, as I said, a farmer would use. He would put on, on his animals uh, like two oxen, two cattle. It was like a piece of wood with two holes cut out for their heads to go inside there. And then it would like harness on their shoulders and then they would plow and it would keep them on the same row kind of together as they're plowing and, 
and, uh, and working. And that's a yoke. And he says that that's, and he's, but that's not the yoke, that's not the word Jesus uses when he's referring to yoke. He actually uses a different word that refers to a different type of yoke. There was, there was a different yoke. Now, the, there was a standard yoke that was cheaper, that was more, uh, more common because it was less expensive. It was kind of like the Israeli Walmart version of yokes. You know, you just go there, it's cheaper, one size fits all, or maybe large, medium, and that's about it. But then there was another kind of yoke, and this is the, the word that Jesus uses, that is a custom, custom yoke. In other words, farmers that really cared about their animals, they would actually measure their, their, the size of their animals' shoulders. Because if you just had this, this cheap yoke on, it just it never really fit right. And so by the end of the day, you'd be bruised, maybe bleeding, very sore, because it didn't fit well. But a custom yoke, that was a different story. The animal could just go days and days work way harder, wouldn't be bruised, wouldn't be sore, or certainly not sore like they would be with his other yoke. And this is what God offers. He says, that's the kind of yoke. He says, I want to have a life, and you use your gifts and your talents, that is custom for you. Custom for you. You're not just doing it in your own strength. And you see this idea of rest comes up over and over. That's a biblical concept, to, to be at rest. And he offers rest for you. Rest is not physical rest. I've talked to many people over the years that have said, oh, I'm burnt out. But when I start talking to them, oh, it's almost never physical. It's emotional. It's, it's in the soul. It's, and, and Jesus wants you to be fulfilled deep in your heart with a fulfillment that only comes by being connected and yoked in with him. And he has something customized for you. You know, measured just for you. It's like, you know, this shirt here is just like a medium, you know, but if I were to get a custom suit, you know, I'm, somebody's going to have to measure this, these massive pecs of mine. And, <laughs> you don't have to laugh that hard. I know it's not true, so <laughs> actually kind of taking a hit there, but. but this is a different kind of strength, you know, that he says, I'm going to customize what I have for you. Customize. And, and it reminds me of the verse where uh, in Isaiah, he says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will mount up like wings on eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. And so here's this idea of, of, of rest. If you, you know, you've, have you ever seen an eagle fly? Eagles, they soar, right? They will mount up and they'll like soar like an eagle. So eagles, they, man, they just, they're just like cruising around, you know, I'm bad, I know it. You know, they're just, when I see an eagle, man, I get like patriotic. I want to like say the Pledge of Allegiance or something. Like, oh man, an eagle. It's so cool. They just, you know, when an eagle gets, decides to leave its nest, it will wait for a, a, uh, a thermal updraft. So all it has to do is put its wings out and it shoots up in the air. Now there's other birds I've got them around my house. Little teeny, often like little birds, man, they, they're working hard to fly. I mean, they, they, they get around, but they're flapping all out. They're not like an eagle at all. <laughs> that looks so tiring. And it is. They can't fly as far, right? They're not like an eagle. They can just soar around. Some of you are like that. You're flapping like a bird, you know. Sunday, 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 and you're not operating in the rest that God has for you. God wants you to soar like an eagle, where you're depending on a strength that's beyond yourself. You can get from A to B, flapping real hard, or you can, you can rest in the Lord. And God has, he, he wants to come along and, and join up with you. That's what Jesus said. Come, find rest, join and be part of his plan for you. Now, if you're just going to do things on your own, you're not going to find it. It comes by releasing control. It sounds scary, but, but really it's, I mean, it's, it's like the eagle. Just, I'm going to just let God, I'm going to let him direct. He's going to script my life. I don't have to do it all myself. Second thing when we let God control us is we start to discover our God-given identity. God has given, he has thought through before you were even born who you were supposed to be. And often we let other people write on our lives 
and created identity for us. Many times we've had our identity stolen. You know, there's all this digital, you know, identity theft. That's a big concern. You have life lock and secure ID and these companies that are saying, we'll help protect your identity. You don't have to, you know, if you, and if it's stolen, we'll help you get back on track. And we have this insurance for that. And, you know, that's a problem, obviously, if you have your identity stolen, your digital identity stolen. But it's a way bigger problem when your true identity is stolen. Like your God-given identity. And we get lost. And Jacob certainly got lost with his identity. Here's what's happening we see in his life. He says, he says, what is your name, the man asked. This is that angel of the Lord. He replied, Jacob. Now, he knew what his name was, but he wanted him to see himself face to face and kind of own it. Hey, I'm, I've been trying to, you know, make things happen in my life. Whatever it takes, if I manipulate or trick people, it doesn't matter. Uh, and, and really, and I've made a mess of it. So he kind of has to own that right there. And then he says, no, your name will no longer be Jacob. So he's going to change his identity. See, but it, his identity is going to go back to the way he saw him from the very the way God saw him. He saw potential in him. He saw something different than what everybody else, what he, certainly what he, what he saw of himself. The man told him, from now on, you will be called Israel. Israel means prince of God. He goes, yeah, yeah, well, sure, you've been, you know, trying to manipulate things. I see you as a prince. I see you as something different. And he goes, because you have fought with God, he's wrestled with God and with men and have won. So it's a, it changes everything when you let God start to write your script, when you release control. Now, I, for years, I was writing my own script, certainly as a kid and then in high school, just trying to do things the way I thought they should be done. I gave my life to Christ when I was 18, but I didn't really know what that meant. And I, I didn't, there was no relinquishing my life to God in any, in a way. I wasn't going to church, wasn't in a small group, didn't know that was a value at the time. So for like two and a half, three years, I'm just like plugging away, doing the same thing. I've, I'm a Christian, but that is it. I mean, I, I'm praying, but, I, and, and one of the things that I was, I was, I was in college, but I really, I was doing terrible. I was on and off probation. I graduated from high school with two D's and two F's. So that's not like, you know, my parents didn't have like, you know, a little sticker of me on their back of their car, you know. <laughs> my kid sucks, you know. <laughs> Because I was writing my own script. I was trying to do things. I was flapping away. And then I went on a retreat. And I, and I discovered as I started praying and listening to some, some speakers and reading God's word, God said, I had a different identity for you, Andy. I had a different plan. I remember just like going, wow. I mean, just like being totally caught off guard. Really? I mean, I had no idea he wanted to be that involved in my life. And so certainly as a college student, that was the main thing I was doing. And God said, I want to help you. I want to help you do good in school. I thought, really? You know, I, I believe, I don't think Jesus likes D's and F's and stuff. I, I don't think that's his, his, his gig. I think if that's what you're getting, you probably shouldn't be in school or something needs to change. And it did for me. So I just, I came back to school, changed my major, started studying differently, started praying before I studied, praying as I'm taking tests. And I went from on and off probation, terrible grades, to getting almost straight A's from then on. I ended up going to graduate school and got graduated magna cum laude in graduate school all along, just learning, hey, God wants to be part of this part of my life. And then I realized he wanted to be part of my dating life. And when I got married, he wants to be part of my marriage, married life. Jesus wants to speak into how I raise my kids, how I spend my money, how I, inv he wants to be part of all of it. That's all part of recognizing I'm not going to just write my own script. God has an identity for me and it's his God-given identity. And when we start to discover that, you start to enter into a whole new place in your life. John 142 is one example of many where God has an encounter with somebody and gives them a new identity. Here it's Andrew's brother. Andrew is a disciple of Jesus. He brings his brother, says, hey, look at, you know, this is the Messiah. And here's what happens in their encounter. It says, and he brought him to Jesus. That's Andrew bringing Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John, but you will be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. Simon meant reed or like a, a uh, some kind of uh, 
plant that would sway easily with pressure and it, like wind. And he goes, no, no, no. I don't see you as somebody who sways easily to pressure. I see you as a rock. And so your name will be Peter. And that's how I see you. And he goes, and I'm going to build a church on people just like you. So God gives us a new identity. He, we get that when we go to God. And then thirdly is we get a new joy. Joy is so important because I think that in our world, everybody's looking for entertainment, looking for happiness. Hey, let's go to the happiest place on earth. I guess that means we go to Orlando. You know, I mean, we just, everybody's looking for that. But God says, really, that's found in joy, which is not external, it's internal. Happiness comes from the word happenstance, means it's based on our circumstance. If good things are happening, around you and there's lots of you know uh, lots of entertainment you're at you're on a boat at a lake fishing then you're happy but you can have joy even in the midst of difficult circumstances very very challenging you can be suffering you can have all kinds of stuff going on and yet you can have a joy inside your life and uh and watch what happens to jacob it says please tell me your name jacob said and he's, he's wanting to know the angel's name or, or God's name. He says, why do you want to know my name? The man replied, and he blessed him there. He goes, I don't have time to get into all about what my name is and what it means, God says, but what you really need is not just something mentally. You need something in your soul. You need me to bless you. And, he's, and then he blesses him. Now, a blessing, I think sometimes this word is one of the most misunderstood words in the Bible. Often people think, oh, if you're, I'm blessed. You know, you tell somebody you just bought a car, ooh, you're blessed, you know. You get a new job, ooh, you're blessed. You get a raise, you're blessed. You go on an awesome vacation, you're blessed. Now, those things are fine, but that's really not what it means to be blessed. When you look at the Bible, what it means to be blessed is not something just financial or good things to happen to you like that. No, blessing is something, in, in, it's inside. That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, where the Beatitudes are blessings, Jesus says, you'll be blessed. I want to bless you like this. You'll be blessed. They're, none of them are connected to finances. I mean, there's nothing wrong with having finances, but that's not what blessing means. In fact, the word blessing is the word uh, makarios, and here's one in Matthew 5, 6. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. You see, what, the blessing that God gives us is, is, is something that is a joy unspeakable. And, it, and, and it, it, he says that it's, it's something that goes beyond, it carries us through life regardless of what's going on. So I think these are the three things that Jacob would, if he came out of the stands, he would say to us. I think he, as we close, he would say, hey, just three, don't forget these things. Don't forget. Number three, three words of encouragement. One is brokenness precedes breakthrough. Brokenness precedes breakthrough. Nothing significant happens until we're willing to relinquish control. And that's where we get breakthrough. You're struggling with something. You need breakthrough in a relationship. You need breakthrough in your finances. It really comes down to whatever you want God to bless, you put him first in that area. But it takes brokenness. It takes humility. You have to go. It's often I think uh, people have this idea that God is like real judgmental or God is, he, he expects perfection from us. This is not what the Bible says. God actually, what he, he wants one thing primarily from, from all of us, from you and from me. He wants honesty. He wants us to just to be honest and just to own that and say, hey, this is where I'm struggling with this area, not, not sugarcoat things, not be pretentious. Just say, God, I need your help. I need your involvement in my life. And this is what it means to be, to be broken, you know, where you just... You've got clenched fists and you say, no, I'm going to release it. In Ezekiel 47, God invites us to come into a relationship with him. He says, join, come into the river, you know. And, and, and he says, some people only go ankle deep. Some people go in, you know, knee deep. Some people waist deep. And then some people just kind of like, they, they go swimming. And when, when you're in above your head, right, you're, you no longer have any kind of, your feet aren't on the ground anymore. I mean, you're, you're going wherever the river's, wherever the river's taking you, right? Wherever the current's going. And he goes, that's what I want. He goes, I have plans for you as long as you're locked in place. You're, you're going to miss some of those. You're going to miss some of those. So he invites us into, into go deeper with him. Psalm 51, 17 says, the, tr the sacrifices, the true sacrifices of God 
See, it's not going to church or listening online, but the sacrifices are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, oh God, you will not despise. Not only he doesn't despise it, he's attracted to it. When we have this place of tenderness before God. In fact, notice what it says, this next verse. It says, God, <clears throat> he opposes. Now, you don't want to be on the other end of that. Anything God opposes, would you agree with me? That's not where you want to be. Well, you know. And so here's what he says. God opposes the proud, right? But shows favor to the humble. So what's, what's our, what are we supposed to do? Well, read these next two words out loud with me. Ready? Humble what? Yourselves, right? Humble yourselves. That's what we need to do. And we're either, we're, we're humbled regardless at some point. But he says, humble yourselves. Therefore, under the might, God's mighty hand, and he will lift you up in due time. So it begins with brokenness. Number two is you must be willing to lose yourself in order to find yourself. You got to be willing to give up the way you wanted to script things out. You're willing to lose yourself. Notice in Mark 8.34, Jesus says, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, anyone who intends to come with me has to let me lead. He's talking about Jesus. You're not in the driver's seat, I am. So here's Jesus is saying, you want to be my disciple? And he's speaking to the crowds. He's speaking to the crowds. How, some of you are in the crowd. And he says, how do you become out of the crowd and become a disciple? Right? That's a good question. How do I become a disciple? Andy, well, I'm glad you asked. Here's how you become a disciple. You come out of the stands onto the playing field. You say, God, I want you to, I want to give up control. I want, I want you to help control my life. That's what it means. It's a, it's, it's a declaration on your behalf to God saying, I invite you into this process, God. I want you to be the driver. Jesus said, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And so here in the vineyard, we like to say, go all in. Go all in. Give God a shot. What if you were, some of you have been a Christ follower, but your, your life hasn't changed a whole lot. You're not real happy with where you're at. What if you were to say, for one year, I'm going to go all in. I'm going to just do everything that they say. I'm going to take growth track if I haven't done that. If I haven't been water baptized, I'm getting water baptized at the next baptism. If I haven't, if I'm not serving on the dream team, I'm going to be part of that. I'm going to make a difference with my gifts and my talents. I'm going to get involved in a small group. I'm going to serve on serve day. I mean, I'm just going to do it. And watch and put that to a test for one year. I guarantee your life will look totally different. Totally different. You'll enter into something where God will bless your life. On the flip side, you know, when people start pulling away, often, you know, they find themselves in a, in a, in a difficult situation. I had somebody call me just three days ago. They were talking, they were, they were, in a, they were humbled. They were in a broken place. Their life has, had fallen apart. And he was saying to me, he's going, you know, because he's been in our church for a while. He goes, you know, there was a time when I was in a small group. I was leading a small group. I was, you know, I was, I, I was serving on the weekends. I was doing all this, and life was great for me. He goes, my life has fallen apart. And he goes, I'm so sorry. Now, he didn't have to apologize to me. Because he was, I mean, he was the one in a, in, in, in where his life's falling apart. But, you know, I don't want that for anybody. I'm telling you, when you put God first in your life, and you, God, he, he's going to come and he's going to, you're sharing your, God's yoke. It's gonna, he's going to put a customized yoke on you. Life will be so much better. So I encourage you. Take your next step, whatever it is. If you've never put your faith in Christ, that's your next step. If you haven't gotten water baptized, that's your next step. If you haven't gone to growth trek, that's your next step. If you're not on the dream team, that's your next step. If you're not in a small group, that's your next step. But just take whatever your next step is for you. Everybody here, including myself, we all have a next step. And you take that step. And then thirdly, when you find yourself on God's terms, you find fulfillment. You find fulfillment. Now, I want to close with this, this verse so you can go ahead and put your stuff away. And I want you just to, as we close in this verse, it's really an invitation. It's an invitation to let God step into your life in a greater way than he's been in the past. 
And so we're just going to take a few moments, and uh, if Corey can come out, and you can start, uh, you know, playing behind us. Because I want to, I want to, I want you to have this as a prayer. Okay. It says here's so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life. In other words, he says that all, everything, right? He says your kids, your marriage, your career, your schooling, your dating, your money, the whole enchilada, the, the hobbies. He goes and place it before God as an offering. So you recognize that you are a steward or a manager of things, including your kids. If you're a parent, dads and moms, if you're a parent, you are, God, those are, those kids belong to God, not to you. And so you have to recognize you have them for a period of time. And then, and, and you just manage them you, to the best of your ability. And you know, parents, that some days, you, some days you're so frustrated and you're thinking, God, you can have them now. You know, right? <laughs> you don't have to give them away that quick, but, but it, all of it. And he says, embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, here's God's promise. God brings the best out of you. Develops well-formed maturity in you. God has a customized plan for you. You can do it in your own strength and keep flapping away or you can come to God and say, God, I need your strength. I need that rest that you talk about. Every time we see God's blessing in the Bible, there's, it's almost always connected to rest. Not necessarily physical inactivity, but rest for our soul. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, we invite you right now, Lord, to come and you can do something that none of us can do. I certainly don't have any strength in, in and of my own. But Lord, we just invite you right now, Lord, by your power and your strength, Lord, come. For those here, if you here or you're tired, you're, Jesus said, he said, hey, come to me, all those who are tired and weary and burdened. If that is you, Jesus offers an invitation. And it begins with, come to me. He says, Jesus says, come to me. And so you just come to God. Say, God, I want to lay my yoke down, the one that was scripted by others or scripted by myself. And I want your custom fitted plan for my life. Would you do that? Say, God, I want that. Help me to start to walk toward that, to walk in your strength, to recognize I have a, 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 a God-given identity, and there's a joy that regardless of the circumstances that you will give me and support me. in. If you've never asked Christ into your life, do that now. Say, Jesus Christ, come into my life. I want to follow you. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Would you do that? Say, God, thank you for making the first move toward me. Because frankly, a lot of times we don't, we're not, he's not even on our radar. He's not even a blip on the radar. And today he's right there in front of you saying, and giving you an invitation for rest, for joy, for strength, for a new identity. You say, God, I want that. And I pray that in Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for tuning in to today's message. If God is impacting your life through this ministry, join us in reaching others by investing today. You can give by texting your donation amount to 757-230-2110 or by going to vineyardchurch.com slash give. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel so that you never miss an update. We'll see you next week.